But good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sierra Nevada Alliance's November webinar. I am Jennifer Marshall, and I'm the Alliance's Development and Community Engagement Director. And I'm so happy that all of you could make it here today. So I'm pleased to introduce Chris Ringness with the El Dorado Community Foundation. He is the Public Relations and Communications Coordinator and he will get into the essentials of telling your organization's story to help connect with your supporters and donors. And he will also cover the importance of creating a communications plan that includes best practices for your website, social media, and e-blasts. And so I actually am going to turn it over to Chris to kind of um, tell let him tell you a little bit more about himself and then just get right into the presentation after that. Thank you, Jennifer. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so that's what I was supposed to be talking about today. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, let's see, make sure that the, is my screen share not going away? Uh, does everybody see the slideshow? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, well, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming. Need to get that out of there. There we go. Uh, thank, you for, thank you all for coming today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the world of communication, how it's changing, uh, and how you can adapt to those changes to help with your branding, your messaging, and your storytelling. So in recent years, more people have turned to digital solutions, right, than ever before from every, for everything from meetings to entertainment to news media. We all know this. Uh, we probably all recognize examples within ourselves. Um, for instance, when was the last time you picked up a magazine versus listened to a podcast? Uh, do you read books or do you listen to them? If you read them, do you use an e-reader? Zoom has become a household name since March of 2020, and now Mark Zuckerberg wants us all to start working in virtual offices in the metaverse. Um, you know, I for one can't wait to gossip around a virtual water cooler with my colleagues' avatars. Um, but jokes aside, the world of communication is changing, and it's changing at a faster pace than ever before. So what does that mean for how we communicate, how we craft our messaging, uh, how we brand ourselves, and how we build a story. It impacts everything, right, from how we reach our target demographics uh, to what platforms we use to do so, and our, our ability to stay relevant in a world that is moving faster and faster every day. Now, it's important that we try to keep pace with the changing world of communication, uh, because not doing so does mean we risk becoming irrelevant, um, but it doesn't mean that we should just jump at every, you know, at every new fad, uh, jump on every new bandwagon that comes along. Um, paying attention to the growth trends of different platforms, paying attention to your audience's needs, uh, they're critical to deciding where and how to allocate your marketing and your communication efforts. Um, so this is really where... Uh, reacting to change is probably the better choice, unless for some reason you feel like your organization needs to be on the absolute cutting edge of new trends. Uh, it's the less risky approach, and it allows you to let your audience guide you to where they are, as opposed to you trying to guide your audience to where you think they need to be, because that, that doesn't usually work out too well. So speaking of your audience, uh, let's talk about, you know, who they are, um, because knowing who you're trying to get your messaging to is half the battle. Um, getting that message to them and getting them to notice is the other half, um, but we'll talk about that part later. Um, first of all, uh, are you targeting a specific age group? Uh, are you targeting people with specific interests, um, people from a specific geographic area? Um, you know, figuring out who you're trying to target will help you build a list of the people that you are actually uh, that you are actually going, going to get buy-in from, right? So there's certain platforms like Facebook, for instance, that let you target specific demographics with ad buys. 
Um, but then those uh, those are, are are labeled as ads. And La photo. Uh, sounds like somebody else uh, is talking. Maybe not on mute. Uh, that's all right. Um, and and you know you can also you can also purchase uh, you know mailing lists right from from data brokerages. But I really don't recommend those approaches. You're always going to get better buy-in from an audience that's organically grown uh, as opposed to one that you're paying for uh, either through ads or or through you know. Um, compiled lists from data brokerages. Um, so how do you go about building an organic list? Um, and it's actually lists. It's not just one list because we're talking about, we've got email lists, we've got our snail mail list, every social media platform uh, that we're on, we've got our own followers, uh, you know, specific to that platform. So it's, it's a multitude of different lists that we're compiling here. So first and foremost, most important thing is to make sure that the content that you're putting out there, however you're putting it out, which whichever medium you're using, is engaging and relevant. Uh, if it's engaging and relevant, people are going to want to sign up for more. Uh, they are going to sign up for your newsletter. They're going to, you know, follow you on on your social media platforms because they like what it is you're saying and it's relevant to them. Second, do you have a website? You should, and if you do, uh, you should have a sign up for any of your contact lists, um, uh, uh, links to follow you on your social media, all of that on your website. Um, for sign up lists, right? For contact lists, even if you're not going to be using those lists right away, you're not going to be, you know, sending out email blasts or or, or e newsletters or anything like that right away. It's good to start collecting those emails right away. Anybody that is willing to put in the effort to sign up for a contact list already has buy-in for whatever it is you're doing or selling, uh, et cetera. Uh, do you send emails? If you send emails, and I'm willing to bet 100% of you do, uh, you should add a call to action in your signature, right? A call to action to follow you on social media with links to those specific, uh, your so your specific social media pages, and you know, a sign up to uh, to your newsletter uh, with a, a link directly to a landing page where they can sign up for for your newsletter, um, things like that. Every single email we send out can have that call to action in our signature, and we don't have to do any work for it, right? We set that up in advance, and then every time we we, we send an email or reply to an email, uh, we're we're making that ask, and it's and it's kind of a soft ask. Right? Right? It's not, um, it's not a hard ask, and it's a really easy one to just slowly uh, cultivate a following. Um, and then, of course, you, you should always cross pollinate. When any, anytime you're putting out content, say you put out your monthly newsletter, right? Um, other publications uh, and other publications, you should always link to those publications through your social media channels, right? With, um, you know, sign up for our future newsletters here uh, on that, so on that, uh, you know, social media post. Um, so that you're always, you're capturing your social following in your other contact lists and vice versa, right? So on your newsletter, you want to always make sure you have your social media links. So that cross-pollination will help all of those lists grow over time. And then of course, who are you trying to reach? Um, donors, clients, anyone and everyone that'll listen, uh, putting a name to your target audience can help you better determine what specific demographics that audience might fall into, uh, and, and can also help provide insight, which can pro help provide insights, uh, to what communication methods are going to work best for that audience. Uh, for instance, are they heavily active on social media? If so, what platform? Um, do they tend to be less tech savvy and, um, you know, prefer printed material that they can get their hands on, right? Uh, something tangible. Usually you're going to find that it's a mix. Uh, it's not, you know, just one specific demographic uh, that you're going for. And so the importance of diversifying the, the different mediums and platforms you are trying to engage with that audience um, with can't really be overstated. Um, so you need to diversify. How can you get the most bang for your buck while you're spreading yourself out between multiple platforms and multiple mediums? Um, creating content that's flexible is the answer. Um, here's an example. 
you're creating a publication for print, right? Why not print that same thing or rather publish that same thing digitally at the same time? So you've already created a digital version of what you're about to send off to the printers. It's just one more step to take that digital creation and turn it into an ebook using some online platform like Issue or I can't think of another one offhand, but there's there's a number of different ebook platforms online where you can take a PDF publication that you're going to print and turn it into an ebook that you can then blast out on your social media. Um, another example of, uh, of, 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 of creating flexible content that you can use multiple ways and in multiple places. Let's say you're working on uh, connecting with Gen Z and you've identified that a ton of Gen Z are on TikTok, right? So you learn the ins and outs of TikTok, you make a sweet TikTok video, you upload it to TikTok. Now you can also use that same video on other social media platforms. You can put it up on YouTube, you can put it out on Facebook, right? So you're, you're utilizing all of those different avenues, um, you know, to, to hit multiple different audiences. Um, that seems pretty basic, um, but that kind of diversification uh, not only is going to spread your message to a wider audience, but it's also going to insulate you from industry changes. So let's say you put a ton of effort into building your following on TikTok only to have the government come along and uh, ban it in the U.S., which is actually something that the FCC has floated a couple of times. Um, so who knows if something like that is going to happen. But if you're, if you're building that audience uh, on multiple platforms, not just uh, the, the one, that ban isn't going to impact, uh, impact your organization as much. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of communication methods. We're going to go into a more of a deep dive on social media, um, so I'm saving that one for last, um, but we'll start out with like printed materials. So printed materials, the world of printed materials kind of changed uh, a bit in the last year and a half. The cost has skyrocketed. Um, in part because, you know, um, supply, uh, supply chain issues, but that's been exacerbated by uh, paper shortages that have been driven by corrugated box production uh, to fuel, you know, the massive increase in online ordering in recent years. Um, so it, it's, it, it's one of those things where uh, you probably should start to uh, diversify away from printed material if you can. Uh, printed publications, uh, they are still useful. Uh, but they are becoming more and more antiquated. And depending on who your target audience is, they may not be return, be providing a return on investment uh, in terms of engagement uh, compared to the, the increased cost in, in, in putting them out. Um, now, if your target demographic skews, maybe older or individuals that, that do want to have printed materials in their hands, um, you, you may need to consider uh, continuing those publications. Um, but you do want to make sure you're publishing them digitally as well. Now, if you do need to print, um, you really want to try and avoid waste on printed materials. Uh, so don't include information that's going to quickly become dated um, because you're going to be you're going to be printing in bulk. Uh, chances are, um, the difference anybody that's done any printing knows the difference between printing 500 copies of something and a thousand copies of something uh, is not that much. It's definitely not double. Um, it's it's usually uh, only a small amount more. And so uh, you're going to want to take advantage of that bulk, but you're also not going to want to throw away a ton of what you just printed because it becomes dated very very quickly. Um, digital publications. Now that is where the industry is headed. Uh, and between rising printing costs and more opportunity for engagement through digital medium, as well as better tracking for that engagement, um, you can get, you know, analytics on who is engaging with your, your digital content um, that isn't really possible with, with hard copy printed material. It's only going to be a matter of time before virtually everything is published digitally, uh, if not exclusively digitally. Um, that's maybe a little farther off exclusive, uh, exclusively digital, but um, I, I see a world where that's coming, um, you know, in the next couple of decades. But getting out ahead of that trend now is probably a good idea, uh, and it allows you to share your publications on multiple platforms. You can link out those publications on social media. 
Um, you also get the ability to access them and edit them after publication. So, you know, if you if you don't, you know, if there's an error that you don't catch and you've sent it off to the printers and, they, and it comes back and you see that error, you know, you've got a thousand copies of something and you can't fix that error without reprinting it. Uh, whereas a digital version, you can just go in there, make a quick edit, and nobody will be the wiser. So email communication is the next form of communication uh, we're going to just touch briefly on. Um, everybody's pretty familiar with how email works and, and what it's good for. Um, but it's, you know, it's generally going to be things like reminders, uh, e-newsletters, save the dates, things like that. Um, but the important thing to do with emails is to collect emails whenever possible. Um, good digital communication is going to rely on building a robust contact database. Um, so always find ways uh, to ask for an email. And nothing beats organic lead generation when it comes to collecting emails. As I mentioned before, you can always buy an email list, but I really wouldn't advise it. All that's going to do is get you a list full of people that are going to quickly click that unsubscribe button and never engage with whatever you're you're sending them. You might, you know, hit one in every, you know, few thousand that actually cares and is like, oh, this is relevant to me. I think I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got this. Most people aren't. Um, they already get enough junk in their email and, uh, and they don't want, you know, they don't want more of it. Um, so social media, as I mentioned, social media is where we're going to dive a little bit deeper. Um, I'll go over, you know, each of the major, major platforms here individually. Um, and, and this part uh, of the presentation is the one that's really been plaguing me for the last couple of weeks because it seems like every day I'm having to update the information I'm providing um, just to make sure that it stays relevant. Um, if, if some of the big social media platforms, particularly Twitter, I'm looking at you, could just calm down a little bit uh, with, with things going on, I'd appreciate it. Um, but whether we like it or not, Social media is uh, an essential tool for communication and messaging. Uh, most, most everybody out there engages with one or more platforms, uh, social media platforms every day. Um, so we're going to cover the largest ones, the most prevalent ones. Um, there's several like LinkedIn, Reddit, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Nextdoor, Pinterest. Um, I probably keep going. There's a ton of social media platforms, and we're not going to cover most of those. Most of those are too niche. Uh, or not widely used enough to be really worth taking a deep dive into today. But I want to I wanna reinforce that go where your audience is. Um, so if one of those uh, social media platforms that I'm you know, not talking about is where a good chunk of your audience is, you need to be there. That's somewhere you need to explore. So first, we'll talk about Facebook and Instagram. Now, I put them both together. Um, even though they're very different in the kind of content that you that you put out on them, um, but they're both owned by Meta. Um, so I did want to talk about these ones together. So Facebook had a pretty meteoric rise, uh, and it's finally had uh, had some had some quarters here that haven't been so good. It's it's starting to uh, it's starting to fall in popularity. Uh, is it going the way of the dinosaur? Maybe, maybe, but slowly. Um, you know, despite Zuckerberg trying to force us all into the matrix known as the metaverse, um, Facebook is becoming more and more irrelevant uh, every day. And more and more people are realizing that they're really just being farmed for data uh, and fed by an algorithm that that doesn't care about anything but uh, showing them things that, that they can buy, uh, that they want to sell them, trying to sell them on things. Um, and it's not really showing them things that are that are relevant to their interests. Um, and couple that with younger generations choosing never to install Facebook in the first place. And you do have a recipe for a slow extinction. But that being said, Facebook still has the second largest user base of all social media platforms. So it really can't be ignored if we want to reach as many people as possible. Uh, in fact, it is still hitting about 70% of most U.S. demographics uh, using Facebook to some degree. Um, so it's definitely still relevant, and you definitely still want to be there. Now, Instagram, uh, the, the, kind of the opposite is happening. So uh, Instagram is actually growing in popularity. Now, if Facebook, uh, you know, completely dies, is is Instagram going to follow? I'd say probably not. Um, 
you know, usage might begin to decline over time as maybe the new, you know, hot thing comes along that uh, that younger people are, are downloading. But right now, uh, Instagram is still growing in, in several demographics, particularly with teens. Um, so the younger generations are uh, engaging with Instagram more than um, than they than they are things like Facebook. Um, so it is still growing. In fact, um, Instagram is being used by about 50% of 18 to 29 year olds and about 70% of uh, 30 to 49 year olds, which is pretty, pretty significant. Uh, and I think that that, uh, that younger uh, demographic, the under 18 demographic is actually using it even more uh, than, than 50%. So, but something to keep in mind for the coming years, um, the era of Facebook uh, will come to an end. Um, fewer and fewer teens under 18 are using Facebook each year, and at some point that demographic is going to stop downloading Facebook altogether. Um, so, you know, it's something to just watch out for. Um, don't put all your eggs in the Facebook basket, in other words. Um, and another factor that's going to play into the future of Meta as a whole uh, is the metaverse. Um, they've been dumping money like crazy into the metaverse. And so far, uh, public reaction to Zuckerberg's vision of what he wants the metaverse to be is not really sitting well with consumers. Um, I think that's a, a big part of why Meta recently announced 11,000, uh, I believe it was 11,000 layoffs. Um, so the question really does become how many billions of dollars is Meta willing to put uh, into or flush down the toilet rather, uh, trying to make Metaverse a thing and will it eventually pay off? I don't have the answer, but it's something to look for uh, and to watch out for, for sure. So now let's talk about the giant blue bird in the room. Um, it almost seems like Elon Musk is on a mission to speed run Twitter into the ground. Um, but who knows, right? Who knows what goes on in the mind of billionaires? Um, regardless, expect Twitter to be pretty volatile for the foreseeable future. Um, this is another one I wouldn't put all my, my eggs in. Um, what will Twitter look like in a year with uh, Elon Musk at the helm? Time will tell, um, but of the last couple of weeks or any indication, um, it's not looking very bright. Uh, they've been hemorrhaging users. Um, I do have some demographic data for you uh, on, on Twitter uh, that I'll get to in a minute, but I just want to preface it with take it with a grain of salt because things have changed already and, uh, and it's going to be probably another year before the dust settles and we can really get some good uh, updated demographic information about Twitter. Um, so keep an eye out for another platform to pop up uh, as a Twitter competitor. I've actually already seen a couple of articles about a couple of, um, and I don't recall the names of the, I think one new and one existing platform that are already scooping up some of those users that are that are abandoning ship from Twitter. Um, so it's definitely gonna be something to watch out for uh, as a potential competitor uh, that maybe, maybe takes over uh, the space that Twitter occupies. Uh, so, because Twitter is is kind of unique uh, among social media platforms, it's it's really a direct line of communication with the people that are interested in you, right? So, think of it almost like an active dialogue with your followers, um, where you can provide them, you know, real time updates on things. Um, so that really is why I, I suspect that something will come along to fill the void if if Twitter, um, you know, kind of kind of suicides itself. Uh, here with, with Musk at the helm. Um, demographics wise, and again, take it with a grain of salt, but Twitter tends to skew younger uh, with over 40% of 18 to 29 year olds in the US using Twitter. Uh, they also tend to skew towards higher education and higher income levels uh, with about a third of Twitter using, users having college degrees and making over 75K annually. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind that those numbers uh, have already changed, um, but we, you know, everything's too new uh, to have any updated uh, demographic data about Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and believe me, I've been looking. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, one that's um, really the new kid uh, on the block here, TikTok. And, and, and TikTok is the future at least for now, assuming again, as, as I mentioned before, TikTok has been talked about uh, getting banned, being banned in the US by the FCC. So assuming that doesn't happen, uh, this is going to be the social media platform to watch over the next decade. 
uh, the explosive growth that TikTok has seen over the last few years has put it solidly at number two in overall usage for teens, uh, only beaten out by YouTube, which is an absolute industry behemoth, um, which we'll actually get to in a minute. Um, so the demographic data shows that 70% of teens uh, aged 13 to 17 are using TikTok. But you say, but Chris, you know, my demographic isn't teens. Why should I care about that? The answer is simple. Those teens are going to grow up and they will become your demographic. And guess what? They're still going to be using TikTok. So social media platforms aren't something that you graduate from one and move on to the next one. Today's TikTok users aren't just using TikTok until they're ready to move on and start using Facebook. They're using it instead of Facebook, and that's not going to change. Um, you know, maybe something new and hot will come along and replace TikTok, um, but they're definitely not going to be going over to Facebook. Um, so you definitely want to start to put together a presence uh, on, on TikTok if you want the future generation, Gen Z in particular, uh, to know about you uh, and to, and as they become your demographic, uh, to want to engage in what you're putting out there for them. Um, so TikTok's niche, if you're not familiar with TikTok, uh, is uh, short form vertical video content. And um, popular trends on TikTok spread like absolute wildfire. Uh, it's actually been pretty insane to see a platform as new as TikTok explode the way it has. Um, for those that don't realize just how new TikTok is, TikTok was launched in 2016, so they're only six years old. Um, to give you an example of just how big TikTok has become in such a short time, YouTube, which has been around uh, since, what, 2005, I think, uh, their top performers are topping in at about 111 million subscribers, right, at their highest in 2022. 111 million subscribers on the highest subscribed YouTube channels. TikTok's top performer has over 141 million followers already, and it's only been six years. And I'm not even sure if that individual has been on TikTok for that entire amount of time. So it's 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 growing and it's growing fast. And it's something that, um, you know, most everybody needs to at least try and start to establish a presence on. So now we'll talk about YouTube. And YouTube is still the king when it comes to usage. And there's really not anybody else that's close to the throne. Um, so their stats in this department in usage are kind of bonkers. Over 80% of the total U.S. population uses YouTube, uh, and 95%, 95% of 13 to 17 year olds use YouTube on a daily basis. That's insane. So YouTube's demographic stats or stats in, in, uh, across the older demographics are only going to get better as those younger uh, individuals age up into some of the demographics that are probably what your target demographics are. Um, they're also easily the most stable social media platform. All that drama that we're seeing with Facebook and Twitter uh, and even TikTok, um, you, you don't see that kind of thing uh, for the most part with YouTube. They've had their, their you know, minor scandals over the years. Uh, with various creators and things like that, but they're pretty untouchable in that department. Um, and and in, in large part, I think one of the reasons they're as stable as they are is, is a lot of people don't view uh, YouTube as a social platform, but it definitely is. Uh, and video, just as a medium uh, in general uh, for short-form messaging, has become more and more popular recently in large part because of TikTok. And YouTube has launched its own version of that short form vertical video content that uh, has has um, that TikTok has popularized uh, in the form of something called YouTube Shorts. Um, so that's definitely somewhere where you can get in and get and do that cross pollination with uh, TikTok content on YouTube, YouTube content on TikTok, and vice versa. Um, so if you aren't already building a presence on YouTube, uh, in case this isn't obvious from what I've already said, you definitely should start. Um, the best things about YouTube are that it is generally not viewed as a social media and that it has a massive um, 
percentage of pretty much every uh, demographic using it almost daily. Um, so I do have one really interesting stat here. So let this sink in. There was a Nielsen study, uh, you know, uh, Nielsen uh, study from 2020 that indicated that people ages 18 to 49 watch more content on YouTube than all television networks combined. Um, so that's pretty crazy. That's, that's definitely uh, speaks pretty highly of, of YouTube um, and the amount of people that they reach on a daily basis. In an increasingly digital world, um, you know, video is everywhere. So you really should consider starting to put video content out, even if it's just short, uh, short form video content, like, uh, like we've been talking about with, with YouTube and, uh, and TikTok. It's, uh, it's definitely a, a platform that really nobody thinks twice about using. Um, and it's great for video storytelling. Uh, and video storytelling is very, um, very compelling, much more compelling than uh, written storytelling. Um, it's much easier to make an emotional appeal uh, on, in, in video format um, because you're getting more of the senses at once, right? People's visual, auditory, um, uh, you're, you're, you're hitting all those senses and, um, and impacting people more. So some general social media tips that kind of apply to, to all of these platforms, no matter where you're at, um, keep it short and keep it simple. If you've got a longer story to tell, link it, link back to your website with that longer story. In fact, you should always be linking back to your website anyway, um, but that's a great excuse to do so. You've got a long story to tell, you tease it on social media and you link back to your website uh, for the full story. And that also gives them the opportunity to go to your website and engage with it and um, you know learn more about you and, and, and what you do. Um, you also want to uh, make sure that you you are leveraging uh, your other forms of communication to promote your social media, including QR codes uh, on printed materials. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, this is that cross pollination, right? So always uh, be using social media to promote your other forms of, of of communication, your other publications. If you if you create a publication, this is why it's so important. To publish it digitally as well. So you can blast that out on social media because people that follow you on social media might not be uh, following, following you anywhere else. Um, and again, the key to all of this, and we talked about this uh, before, is to just make sure that it is meaningful and relevant, right? Nobody wants their social media feed filled with, with nonsense and garbage. There's enough of that out there already that they're, that they're seeing on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, don't, don't add to that noise. So now we'll talk a little bit about your branding and just your overall message. Um, so why is a strong brand important? You want to stand out um, and, and you want to make sure that you're building uh, recognition within the public space. And that's what your branding is, is going to be good at doing for you. So good branding, uh, it helps you stand out and get your message across to everybody. Um, branding can help you uh, and, and help your organization become more memorable increasing visibility, and generating support, right? And beyond that, strong branding can drive your long-term strategic goals. Uh, it in, it, it'll increase your uh, public trust in, uh, in what you do and who you are, uh, and it'll increase their, their awareness, the public's awareness about what you do and, and the work that you do. Um, this is your, your logo, your website, your mission, publications, everything you do and everything you put out there is part of your branding. Uh, it's, it's how the public perceives you. Um, and you want to make sure you maintain consistency and cohesion with that branding uh, across all the spaces, right? Across, across your website, your social media, everywhere. Um, so, so how do you, how do you build that strong brand? What do you, what do you do? Um, it really depends on where you're at in the process. Uh, some of you might already have very strong, well-established brands, um, and you don't really need to, to, to do any of this. You, you probably want to review it from time to time and make sure that everything is cohesive and, and is consistent across your platforms. Um, but it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something that if you're well established and and the community knows who you are and knows your brand, um, you don't need to worry too much about. Um, but it's a good idea to, uh, for particularly those who are trying to establish a brand uh, and looking for where to start, to take a look at your organizational mission 
and take a look at who your audience is, right? So what can you pull from that information, from your, your organiz organizational documents, your mission, and who your audience is uh, to help craft, um, you know, cr uh, craft what your brand should be and how it will appeal to them. So when you're building a brand, um, you want to know who you're trying to reach. So you can tailor communication to meet their needs. Um, and you want to get specific here, you know, write out their interests, their lifestyle, their motivations, really try and get in their heads, uh, in the heads of your target audience. Um, and, and this will not only help you in building that brand, but also in telling story, uh, in storytelling and, and messaging, targeting that specific audience, right? Knowing who they are and what their motivations are can help you reach them with your messaging. Um, so again, we talked about consistency and consistency again is absolutely key. It's important. You want to make sure you maintain consistency in color schemes, logo placement, logo usage, font, language, everything, right? You want to keep this consistency on your website, your social media, any infographics, brochures, flyers, newsletters, emails, everything that you put out there into the world should maintain this consistency. Um, and you, you probably want to um, actually create a, a, a branding guide too uh, that you can share with if, if somebody wants to, you know, use your logo somewhere, how are they to use it? Uh, are they uh, are they supposed to make sure that um, it's not used against certain backgrounds or certain colors? What font should they use? You know, how do you want other people to represent you as well as how you represent yourself uh, is just as important. Um, so you also want to make sure you have an impressive logo. Now, if you already have a logo and it's impressive, great. If you don't have a logo yet, where do you start? How do you create a logo that is going to capture people's attention and make you stand out? Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, a great logo is going to be simple, but also compelling. It's going to be moving. It's going to be memorable. It's going to communicate who you are, what you're about, uh, all, all at the same time. Um, and that's a, that's a lot to ask of just one little thing. Um, so before designing a logo, uh, you're going to want to probably reflect on your mission, your vision, uh, maybe even summarize all that up in just a couple of words. If you can, that can make a great slogan potentially. Um, is your logo going to be just images or just an image? Is it going to have words? Is it going to have, you know, the, the name of your organization? Um, generally speaking, yes, you want it to have the name of your organization. There's organizations out there and companies out there that can get away with not having their name on their, on their logo. Um, because they're already so well established that they don't need it. Um, but if you're just starting out, you're going to need it. Um, nobody's going to know what that symbol means. Um, and, but you also want to make sure you don't make it too overwhelming, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to have a ton of words on your, on your logo. Um, you usually just a, your, your name of your organization and maybe a slogan is enough. Um, and you also want to make sure you use things like white and negative space, right, to create a balance of elements. You don't want it to be too busy. So the other, the other uh, couple of tips to branding uh, and, and, and crafting your overall message is uh, to use storytelling as a tool. And we talked about visual storytelling. Um, now, whether you're, you're doing visual storytelling through a video format or you're doing written storytelling, uh, you want to make sure you're telling authentic stories. Um, and, and with visual storytelling, you want to make sure that even if you're, if you're writing something out, you're utilizing pictures and images, right? Because that's, they, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and it's very true. Um, but that is, uh, impacting that other sense, right? You're getting another sense involved. You're getting people's, you know, visual, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, vision involved, right? So they're seeing an image that's maybe touching their heart. Um, and you also always want to make sure that any kind of storytelling has a central character. Um, you don't want an abstract concept. People aren't going to relate to that. 
Um, and this could be, you know, this could be uh, an individual to your organization. Uh, if you're doing, um, you know, maybe you're highlighting something about a board member or uh, a staff member, or maybe somebody who's benefited from your organization, or maybe somebody who's contributed to your organization. You want to have that central character that other people can relate to. And then finally, community outreach is, is something that can't be ignored when you're building your brand. Um, your presence in the community is going to be something that resonates with people uh, more than anything else that you put out there. Uh, any, kind of, um, any kind of written piece or, or, or visual piece it isn't going to hold a candle to showing up. Um, it's the it's one of the biggest drivers in building trust and confidence uh, of the community in your brand and in who you are. So so don't forget to show up. Looking at my time here, and I'm I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. Uh, looks like I put together a little bit too much uh, content. Um, so just some additional tips for creating uh, a story, for crafting a story, whether it be visual or written. Uh, again, we talked about social media and keeping it simple. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where um, you're catching up with somebody you haven't seen in a long time, right? You're sharing stories about each other's lives and they ask you, you know, where it is you're working and what is it, what it is, what it is you do? Um, so when you begin telling them about your job and your organization and all the cool things you're doing, do you use a bunch of technical jargon? Do you use acronyms that aren't common uh, outside of your industry? Of course you don't. Uh, you've got an elevator speech, right, that you've practiced a thousand times and you've told a thousand times and it highlights what you do in simple and easy to understand terms. Um, this same concept should be applied to your publications, right? Um, you don't don't expect your audience is going to know all your organization's terminology. Um, don't expect that they're going to understand uh, all of the language that um, you know that you use every day in the office. Um, they're not. You know, you want to use simple to understand language. Um, and if you do have to include technical information, make sure you include uh, you know clear and concise explanations of exactly what that information means. Um, if you can, have somebody that's unfamiliar with the ins and outs of your organization review messaging uh, to help you, you know, with this and make sure that they can understand. If they can understand it, great. If they are having trouble with something, uh, they can point out what they're having trouble with. And if they have trouble with it, chances are the rest of your audience will as well. Um, so be brief. Uh, that's something I could probably take a lesson from today because, as I said, I'm running, low, I'm running short on time here. Um, so, but sometimes it's what you don't say that makes your message more impactful. Um, you know, there is an attention economy out there. Everything is vying for your audience's attention. Um, your messaging is part of that noise. And if you want your messaging to hit home, you need to make sure that it doesn't slowly meander to the point. Um, you're going to lose people if that's the case. You want to get in, you want to hit the high points and get out. Um, you know, this is why brands use slogans, right? Because um, chances are that's what your audience is going to remember is that slogan. Um, so if you do have a way of summing up your messaging into a slogan, it'd be a good idea to try that. Um, you know, there's no hard and fast rule to this either. Um, you know, the, the, the difference in, in types of publications you're putting out, if you're putting out, like, say, an annual report, obviously that's going to be a lot longer and more content heavy than, like, a one-page flyer. But if you strive for readability uh, and, and just remember that, um, you know, that you want to make sure that everything is digestible uh, by your audience, you'll, you'll, you'll succeed. Um, so crafting your message to your audience. We already talked about this, getting inside the head of your audience, uh, making sure you know who they are so that you can tailor what, you, what you're creating, what you're writing to their interests uh, and, and make sure that they uh, want to engage with it. Um, so one of the one of the tips for doing that too is chances are you've got people that are that are within your organization, whether they be staff, board members, uh, you know, maybe even donors or clients uh, that you can that you've got good relationships that you can engage with who um, they are your target demographic, right? They also represent what your target demographic is. So you can utilize those individual individuals to try and help you. Um, craft your storytelling to appeal to them. Because if it appeals to them, chances are you're on the right track if they're what you would consider to be your, your target demographic. Um, and then finally, make sure to deliver. 
Um, the last thing you want to have happen is for your story to be all build up and no delivery. Um, you know, this is going to go over like a joke without a punchline. Um, now, it doesn't mean that the buildup can be ignored, um, both delivery and uh, and uh, and the well, both the destination and the journey are important. Um, but if the destination sucks, nobody's going to remember the journey. Uh, so you just have to make sure that the delivery is impactful uh, to your audience. Uh, so now I, I, I uh, compiled some information about. Um, you know, about your website here. We'll try and speed through this. Um, but, uh, you know, more than virtually anything out there, your website is your public face. And in today's world, uh, it's one of the first things that somebody learning about your organization is going to see. Uh, and because of that, it's important that your website be professional, uh, intuitive, easy to navigate, and comprehensive. Um, you've generally got about one minute to convince somebody that uh, is visiting your website for the first time to stay and learn more. And if you uh, if you fail at that and they and they leave, they're probably not coming back. Um, so you just want to make sure you're using you know impactful language, um, you know good visuals uh, to, to help grab their attention and get them to uh, to want to learn more. You're going to want to answer those those initial questions pretty quickly with the content on your website. You know, who are you? What what are you about? Um, you know, and, and why should they care? Um, so you also want to make sure that uh, that your website um, uh, has elements that will help you build credibility with your audience. Excuse me. Uh, so um, haven't eaten lunch yet. So <laughs> um, stomach's growling. Uh, so one of the things I see a lot uh, is is some smaller organizations or smaller um, businesses will have just a Facebook page or just an Instagram page and not a website. Um, that really isn't a sufficient online presence, uh, and it's definitely not a substitute for a website, and it's not a good way to build credibility. Um, having an actual website uh, is going to do a lot more for that than, uh, than, than not. Uh, and some ways that you can build credibility through your website. Um, you want to make sure you have a secure website using an SSL certificate. I'll touch on that briefly in a minute. I've got a slide on that here. Um, but uh, things like listing staff names, pictures, bios, same for board members. Those are going to help build credibility. Uh, making sure you have all your contact info listed, not just a contact form. You know, you want to have, you know, an info at email, phone number, um, you know, uh, uh, contact form is fine as well, uh, physical location, things like that. Uh, if it's appropriate to have your financials listed on your website, having your audits, 990s, things like that for transparency's sake, also very important. And it's also very important to make sure that your website is intuitive and uh, responsive. So somebody visiting your website should know how to find really any of this information um, very quickly. Um, if you have unintuitive menus, you probably need to review them and, and make sure that uh, that they can be um, uh, that they can be navigated uh, easily. Um, you know have people unfamiliar with your website check it out and if they can if they have trouble finding things chances are other people will as well um so we'll move on here to i mentioned briefly ssl certificates so this is a good example of what it's going to look like if you have an ssl certificate on your on your website and if you don't ssl stands for secure sockets layer uh and it is um essentially for establishing a secure connection between client and server. So your website um, is server, client is the individual who's, um, you know, who is uh, accessing your website. And if they don't see this little lock, um, I'm pointing at the screen, but <laughs> if they don't see this little lock with the HTTPS, that means your website is not secure. Uh, and, you know, all kinds of bad things can happen if you're, if you've got a, a website that's not secure, you know, you can, uh, have individuals, uh, malicious individuals access uh, unsecure data on your on your website, um, especially if you're, you know, an organization that's collecting donations. Uh, your donation portal might be secure, but if your website isn't, your, your visitor who may be wanting to donate isn't necessarily going to click on that donation link to see that it's secure. They're going to see that your website's not secure and they're going to say, nope, I'm not going to, I'm not going to enter my credit card information here. So, 
Um, just a, a, a real brief overview of what, what that's all about. And if you do have questions about that, I can go into more detail or send you documentation on that. But um, last uh, last slide here, uh, before we get to the end, I just wanna talk a little bit about developing a, a communication plan. Um, so a fully fleshed out communication plan is going to incorporate all the methods of communication we've talked about, um, you know, print, social media, digital uh, publications, everything. Um, and it's a good idea to sit down with your organization in like November or December and kind of map out the, 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 the next year so that you know all of the things that you're going to be engaged in, you know how busy you're going to be, uh, and you can plan your messaging and your PR accordingly. Um, this is something the foundation does each year as well. Uh, so we, we put all this uh, out on the calendar. We actually just did it. Um, and, and you can, uh, you can really kind of build out your, your, uh, your plan for the year. Um, now that doesn't mean you need to put all the content together, uh, up front, um, but you can have it all mapped out so you know what you need to create, um, you know, in advance. And something else to just always be thinking about here is, um, you know, pictures and videos are critical components of your storytelling. So you generally want to always be mindful of getting pictures and videos all throughout the year and just creating a repository uh, to draw from. It's going to make it a lot faster to create uh, content and it's going to increase the quality of the content you create uh, throughout the year if you've got these, these visual uh, items that you can pull from. Um, you know, it's, it's always, uh, good to be aware too, of the things that are going on, uh, within your organization's area of focus, um, because sometimes you do need to, uh, jump on something that happens, you know, happens, uh, out in the, in the public space, right? You need to, um, be able to, 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 to talk about that. Uh, if something happens that's within your area of focus, let's say you're focused on housing and there's a massive housing referendum that, uh, that occurs or something in, uh, you know, in California or, uh, or, or locally, um, like we just had recently with the, and you may need to comment on it. Um, and so be aware of those things because they may require you to be a little bit nimble with your communication plan and you may need to put something on hold because you need to address something else. Um, so yeah, be cogniz cogniz cognizant of that. And we are at time and I promised I would give time for question and answer. And I think we're, we're hopefully have a little bit of time for that. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and leave this slide up here so you can get my contact information. Uh, and if you do have questions uh, after the fact, you know, feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, and, you know, without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Chris. I know this is a lot of information and uh, we packed it into one hour. So I, um, I appreciate your time and we may go over just a few minutes, but um, if you have any questions right now, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. We're probably only gonna get to um, probably two questions. And then I'm going to send over any additional questions to Chris and he can respond and uh, I will send the answers out to everyone um, by email. So go ahead and add any questions that you have in the chat and we'll get to them um, shortly. So I invite you to contribute to the Alliance to help us keep these monthly webinars free and accessible to all. You can visit sierranevadaalliance.org slash donate or text WILD SNA to 530-456-4967 and you can help support um, the Alliance's efforts to protect the Sierra Nevada noun for the future. And so here are a few of the questions. Again, we don't have time to go into all of them, but I'm going to ask uh, Chris, how do you measure the strength of an organization's brand and effectiveness of its messaging? And then are you aware of any resources to help us assess our website and branding? So the, the first uh, part, was, was that the same individual that asked both? It was two, but I thought that they kind of, um, I thought that they kind of fit together. So the first one, 
or how do you measure the strength of your branding and effectiveness of the messaging? Yeah, so that that one is kind of difficult um, to. So it's it depends on where you're at, right? If you're if you're just starting out um, and you're and you're maybe playing around with different branding ideas, um, you know, you can you can see about trying to put out a survey, um, you know, that kind of thing to to kind of gauge okay what is resonating with people um now if you're if you're further along and you have an established brand and, and how do you measure whether or not that brand is is effective or not um that one that one's kind of difficult it's it's uh, one of those things where um do you feel like what you're doing is working do you feel like the public has you know that that there is a positive um, view of your organization, you know, within the public, does the public even know who, who you are? Um, and, you know, a, again, something like, you know, a survey, but the problem with the survey is if you're, if you're trying to figure out if the public knows who you are, who are you surveying? Are you surveying people who you already have, you know, a contact, you know, on a contact list, meaning they already do know who you are. So you're going to get skewed data, um, that is a really good question, and and the follow up to that, whether there's any resources out there to help you determine whether or not, um, you know, your your branding is effective. Um, which I think that was the second, that was the follow up, right? Jennifer was, is there is there are there any resources available that? Yeah, resources. Not just is it effective, but um, you know, a lot of us don't have. Communica dedicated communication staff. Um, how can we, you know, make that assessment and then take those next next steps to build a stronger brand? If we we need a little bit of help. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, you know, if you, I'll, I'll put it this way: if you think you need a little help, you probably need a little help. Um, so. As for resources out there that you can help you that, that you can utilize to help build a stronger brand, part of that is putting out better content. Uh, part of that is um, you know showing up and engaging. Uh, so so you know if you're doing all of that, um, but you need help you know creating better content, there's definitely some free resources out there that you can utilize to like for instance, um, you know there was a question about video and video length. Um, and and uh, and I, you know, I can address that specific question, but video in particular is something that not a lot of people they're they're like, okay, well, I created this video, but now what if I want to edit it? Um, it? What do I have to do? How do I edit it? Um, there's free software available that can help you do that. Um, there's free you know photo editing software out there. There's um, it, you know I don't know how many nonprofits we have represented here in in uh, 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 here, but. Uh, Canva is a program that helps you design beautiful content, and it's free for nonprofits. You you have to prove that you're a nonprofit and go through this, some steps, but it's free. So uh, there are a lot of free resources out there that can help you create better and more impactful content, and that can in turn help you, you know, strengthen your branding. Um, but as for um, gauging whether or not your branding is ex your existing branding is currently effective. That is a tough one. Um, I can do a little bit of research and see if I can find a way to go about doing something like that. Um, I have the benefit of having stepped into a role here at the Eldorado Community Foundation uh, in an already extremely well established and um, highly regarded community brand. So. Um, I'll admit I didn't have you know any any struggles or growing pains with that, so I I don't know I don't have uh, a great answer for that right now, but I can look into it and and uh, and forward any information I find on. That would be great, thank you. Just a kind of one closing question here. Um, so I had mentioned before a lot of these nonprofits have dedicated program staff that are really out. Um, guiding the efforts and um, the their mission, and they're really out there doing the work, but don't necessarily have dedicated communications, um, but they know that it's important to, you know, have coordinated messaging um, and make sure the website is strong. Uh, but what 
tip one or two do you have for small nonprofits um, that are in this situation uh, to kind of get moving in that right direction if kind of maybe time is an issue or you only have to focus on one or two things? Okay. Um, well, if you only have time to focus on one or two things, uh, the number one for increasing the you know public's knowledge of you and perception of you, uh, which I did touch on, is get out there and engage in the community. Um, you know, show up. Uh, the and, and, you know unless you're unless you're trying to you know unless your community is on a you know on a on a you know statewide or nationwide it, it, if if we're talking local community showing up is the biggest thing you can do to increase the public's perception and and knowledge of your existence and your brand um i i want to so karen phillips asked uh just uh, briefly want to answer this question. What is, you know, uh, short and simple when it comes to video length, two minutes max, she she asked. So it, it depends, uh, Karen, on what, what platform you're talking about. And what I really recommend doing is, um, you know, spend some time in the platforms you're looking at putting out content for. If you're looking at putting out content on TikTok or on YouTube as shorts, see what other people are doing. See what is common. Two minutes is long. I will tell you that. For, for something like TikTok, two minutes is long. Um, you're wanting something uh, when it comes to TikTok that is digestible in, you know, probably 20 seconds max. Um, if you if if any of you have teens at home, um, watch how they scroll through their social media. Uh, I I watch this with my wife. She she sits there and you know she'll uh, scroll to the next thing, and it's not on screen for more than five seconds before she's scrolling to the next. And so think of you know figure that's how people are engaging with these short form video content, uh, and that's how people engage with Instagram as well. Uh, that's, that's very similar. That just scrolling quickly. Um, and if you you know are on social media yourself, you you probably do the exact same thing. Um, so two minutes is, is definitely long. Now for other video content for like YouTube, if you're not doing short form content on YouTube, two minutes is maybe perfect, but it depends on what it is you're, you're putting out there. Um, so hopefully that helps with that, that answer. Yes, and we do have a couple more questions, but I am going to send those over to you, Chris, okay, no problem. by email. And then uh, you can write up a response that I'll send out to everyone else um, because we um, have gone over the time limit. So I no am going to, yeah, no problem. Um, it's all really important information here. And so thank you so much uh, for your wonderful presentation and to everyone uh, for joining us today virtually. So uh, Chris had shared his contact information. So please reach out to him with any more thoughts or questions that you have. Um, a recording of the webinar will be available shortly on our website and will also be emailed out to you with a short um, evaluation. So we can always, uh, as we're always looking to improve um, and get more ideas for uh, topics that are relevant to our audience. Um, so also you can visit our website to easily sign up for these newsletters, email alerts at sierranevadaalliance.org. And of course, follow us on social media if you're not already. Um, I invite you to join us for our next webinar on December 6th. And we are inviting Dr. Scott Valentine with Lake Tahoe Community College for a presentation on California's geology. So be on the lookout on social media and in your email for a registration link there. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris, and have a great day.